God has to say. Go with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy, the first chapter, the 18th through the 19th verse. And again, for the sake of time, I'm going to start reading. This is Paul. He's talking to Timothy, his son in the gospel, someone who he has reared and trained and developed and very shortly will be passing the mantle on to. And you need to understand that, to understand the context of what I'm getting ready to read. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. For our time tonight, because this is all the time we're going to have, our time tonight, I would like to talk to you about a message that is entitled, Fight for Your Future. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's time to fight for your future. You may have your seats. 1 Timothy 1.18 starts with Paul saying to Timothy, according to to the prophecies according to the prophecies somebody say according to the prophecies pastor Pam has declared from God's heart to us that this will be a season in the time of the prophetic and I take it not just for Christian faith mother uh, mother location central location but I take it for Christian faith every location so as we go back to Arizona, we go back with the agenda and the mandate of understanding that there is a prophetic shift that has to take place. But the word prophecy is very interesting and we need to understand what it means. Prophecy, whether it is spoken by a true prophet or whether it is written in God's word because God's word is prophetic statements. So whether it is a prophet that is reminding you of God's written word or whether it's you opening the Bible and reading the written word, these are all prophecies or prophetic statements. But a prophecy is a promise from God about your inherited future. When you get a prophecy or a prophetic word, it is not speaking to where you are because you don't need encouragement about what you see. You need encouragement to tell you about what is to come to let you know that there is something beyond what you see. So a prophecy is a spoken promise from God. Y'all don't hear me today. It is from God. And, and if it is from God, it's different than a promise from somebody else. Somebody else may make you a promise and it is their intention to make that promise come to pass. But they may not always have the gifting, the ability, the strength to get it done. But if God says, I make a promise to you, God has the gifting, the ability, and the strength to get it done. So prophecy is a promise from God about your inherited future. But understand this about prophecy and the promise. That God will always keep his promises but he is not obligated to make you participate. Are you still with me? There's going to be prophecy spoken. There's going to be the prophetic that comes forth. But God's job is to tell you what's in his heart concerning your future. Your job is to participate in what he said. And the problem is, is that when we hear the prophetic, and I'm guilty of it as well, when we hear the prophetic that tells us that you're going to be great or finances are coming your way or something is getting ready to happen, we sit back down in the lazy boy of Christianity and we don't participate in the process of the things that are necessary to have what God spoke to come to pass. If God tells you uh, he's going to bless you with a brand new job, then baby, you got to participate. You got to get up. You got to open up a paper. They don't do that no more. You got to get online. You got to get on LinkedIn. Y'all got quiet in here, maybe I'm too. You got to do something to participate in what he said. Because your participation is your belief. 
that what he said is going to happen. Because if you don't participate, it means that, God, I really don't believe what you said. It was a nice word. I was encouraged in that moment. It made me feel better to get through my day. But I really don't believe you're going to do what you said. Because if you really believe, you would get up and find out, God, how do I participate? What is it I'm supposed to bring to the table? What is it I'm supposed to do? What is it that you would have me to participate in to make sure that I'm not the reason? I'm preaching too hard, too fast. That I'm not the reason why the prophetic word hasn't come to pass. Are y'all still with me? Every promise contains God's promise, but it requires our participation. The promise is God's part, but the participation, hear me now, is our fight. The promise is God's part, but the participation is our fight. Turn to somebody and say, the participation is your fight. Paul knew in talking to Timothy that there were some great things spoken over his life, that there were some prophetic things that he had spoken into his life, but he was warning Timothy that he had to participate in making sure that what God was speaking and saying was going to come to pass. And in the scripture here, in 1 Timothy 1.19, he says, I, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. So, Timothy, the only reason I'm talking to you is because there's been some prophetic that has been previously spoken to you. He knew there was some stuff he had told Timothy, and he knew there was some stuff that his grandmother and mother had told Timothy because they were people that loved God. And he said, Timothy, I'm not going to let you drop the ball. I'm not going to let you live a lackluster life where the things that God has designed and has prepared doesn't come to pass because you are not participating. Timothy, here are the two things that you need to do in order to participate, in order to wage a good warfare because you got to know, people of God, that if God has spoken to you about your promise and you hear about your intended future, know that the devil heard the same thing and he's not going to just let it happen he's going to fight against you to make sure that you don't make it to an expected end so you got to understand that after a prophetic word comes that there's a fight that's on your hand you got to get ready to fight in order to lay your hands on the promise you may have to lay your hand on the devil before you lay your hand on the promise but you got to get yourself ready to fight it ain't going to be easy. The greater the prophetic manifestation, then the greater the fight. And oh my God, whatever he spoke to you is worth the fight. Are y'all in here tonight, Christian faith? But he told him there's two things that you have to do to wage a good warfare. Two things that you have to do to wage a good warfare. The first thing he told him is you have to have faith. Having faith seems very simple, but having faith in this scripture means specifically this. You have to keep confidence in what God has said. If God has said it, your only job is to keep confidence in it. You ain't got to figure out how. You ain't got to figure out why. You ain't got to figure out, God, I don't feel qualified. All you need to know is that if God was, not crazy, but if God was great enough to speak something crazy to your life, that he meant every drop of what he said. And sometimes we forfeit it because we disqualify ourselves by not believing that what he said could be possible for us. Don't disqualify yourself. Are you here today? Don't, just, don't disqualify yourself. Keep in mind that I've got to believe what God said. If God said you're going to be healed, I don't care how sick you are. You will be healed. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. 
Whatever he said, believe what he said. I hear you, Father. I remember earlier this year, my wife had to be rushed to the emergency room because she was throwing up blood and blood was coming out of everywhere else. We went to the emergency room. Now, when something like that happens, God help me tonight. When something like that happens, my first thing is to call people who pray. I don't get on Facebook to post a post so a bunch of people who don't trust God can talk about where well, she lived a good life. No, I don't need to talk to you. I need to talk to some people that know about a miracle healing working God. So I text some people, I call some people, and I even reached out to her brother who kind of likes me sometimes. I called Bishop. I said, Bishop. I said, Bishop, here's what's going on. And when he heard what was going on, he said, Jason, this is not unto death. It's going to be all right. Now, for you, that may be a casual word. But for me being in the hospital, watching my wife bleeding, it became the prophetic that I held on to. And no matter what the doctor said, Richard, I said to myself, this ain't unto death. Why? Because the prophetic word had been spoken. And I was going to fight for what I heard. Uh, Y'all don't, you don't hear what I'm saying. A few months later, when my, oh, let me finish that testimony. We fought for what God said. The doctors came back in three days later. They said, listen, we don't know what's going on. Not only did she stop bleeding, but we can't find where she was bleeding from. We don't know what happened. There's no scarring. There's no tint. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. There's nothing for us to identify that anything is any longer wrong. Well, maybe that was luck. Nope, that was a prophetic word that we held on to and fought for. Pastor Kathy, two months later, I go to the doctor. The doctor says, uh, Jason, your prostate levels are up. It doesn't look good. And I say, well... I don't know what all that means, but what do I need to do next? They said, you need to do this, and then come back later. We're going to test your blood again. Came back later. They tested it again. They said, your levels are higher. Go to the doctor. They gave me a, an appointment with a urologist, and I was like, well, I'm just going to go to the next doctor. Cam, I pulled up to the building, and it was the MD Anderson Cancer Center. It was then that I realized this is much greater and graver than what I thought it was. Went in, had the x-rays, they did the x-rays, and they said, we see abrasions on your prostate. We've got to go in and do a prostate, not a, 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 a biopsy. Because we got to see if what we see is cancerous. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I said, do what you do. But while you do what you do, I'm going to do what I got to do. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You, you do your work while I do my fighting. You do your testing while we do our praying. You do what you do while we do our fasting. And I'm here to tell you they came back and said, Mr. Turner, we do still see that there, but we want you to know it is not cancerous. There is no cancer in your body. You may say it was luck. Nope. I say it was a fight for the prophetic because there is greatness in me. God is not finished. The devil is mad and he's trying to take me and my wife out, but he can't have us. He won't win because we know what God has spoken. Him. We know what God has promised. We know what God has declared. And we will fight for our future. Are you in here tonight? I didn't come here tonight to give you a nice word so you go back home and say, ooh, Pastor Jason still got it. He can preach. No, I came to deliver to you a word of the Lord that will help you to walk the next days of your life, understanding the profound prophetic that's about to be released in this house. And from this house, hear me, is going to hit the rest of this country. Mm. Bishop, I remember the days when I first came to Christian faith. I didn't come because, stay right there, Antoine. I didn't come because of our connection through my mom. I didn't come because of your preaching. I came because of your prophetic. I remember coming into services, and you would stand to preach after the choir got done. And we were at Burroughs Middle School, and you couldn't preach. 
because you would take off into the prophetic. You would start singing songs prophetically. You would start speaking into the lives of people prophetically. And that's what drew a young teenager to say, I want more of God. I, I know how to preach. I can figure that out. I can follow other people. I can do that. It is to not say anything negative about your preaching because you're one of the baddest people in the world. But that's not what drew me to you. It was your prophetic ability. And I heard God tell me to tell you. And I'm nervous to even say it. But that time is returning, not just here, but to you. That when you stand to preach, the message will become like puzzle pieces all over the place. But the only thing that will be clear is the prophetic and you will take off into songs that the band will have to follow you in and that will have to be the course of the rest of the service because the prophetic is going to take place from your singing. It's going to happen. Young people are looking for the real. And when they see a real prophet and a real prophetess, they will pack this place out. Christian faith, you ain't, this ain't in my notes, it's in my spirit. You ain't seen what God is finna do in this house. The latter rain will be greater than the, and the former rain was immense. Can only imagine what the greater glory, the latter glory is going to be like. But it's going to come not because of presentation not because of skill. It's going to come because of the anointing and because of the prophetic. The days of presentation are drawing to an end. People are tired of coming to church to see a show. They want to come to encounter God. I remember when our praise and worship teams used to fast. I remember when the choirs had to fast. I remember when the band had to fast. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And there was a glory that was in the house. We've got to get back to that place to where the oil is more important than the light. I'm going to say it again. To where the oil is more important than the spotlight. I'm going to say it a third time. To where the oil of God is more important than the spotlight. They say it on my notes, and I'll get back to them if the Lord lets me. But I found out something interesting, Bishop. That sheep are immune to the venom that comes from snakes from a pit. They're called pit snakes. And if a pit snake bites a sheep, a sheep is able to to shake it off because within its blood is the ability to fight off the bite of a snake goats can't do that cows can't y'all don't hear what I'm saying cows can't do that wolves can't do that but sheep can Scientists use the blood of the sheep to create antibodies to help humans fight off the venom from a snake. And you are a sheep of a shepherd. You're walking around here wondering, worrying about what's around your feet, worrying about what people say. Let snakes do what they do. I'm going to say it again. I wish I could come down from here. Let snakes do what they do. You keep following the shepherd. Let snakes keep on hissing. Let them even bite. When they bite, shake it off and keep on following the shepherd. Woo. Somebody shout prophetic. So we have to keep believing God's word. And then the second thing that Timothy tells Paul is this that you have to have a good conscience in other words a good conscience that I'm trying to go through quickly a good conscience means you have the ability to ignore stuff 
<laughs> Not only do you need to remember what he said, but you have to have the ability to, to ignore things that are the opposite of what he said. You got to have both of them. So when people come around you and say, who do you think you are? Why is it that you think you're better than somebody else? You got to have the ability to ignore it. When people tell you, y'all ain't loud enough in here for me. When people tell you your dream is not going to come to pass, you got to be able to ignore it. When people are telling you in the midst of difficult times that God is not with you, you got to be able to ignore it. These are the two things that you have to have in order to be able to fight a good fight. You got to be able to remember what he said and to ignore what everybody else got to say. If you didn't wake me up, be quiet. If you didn't keep a roof over my head, hush your mouth. If you can't put food on my table, go somewhere. If you don't keep my mind working, I need you to hush now. You don't hear what I'm saying. You have no reason to have to listen to the contributions of anybody that doesn't have the ability to keep you alive or living. Uh, Paul, Paul was warning Timothy. He said to him, these are the two things you have to do, Timothy. You have to do these things because if you don't, Timothy, your faith is going to suffer a shipwreck. Did y'all see that? It's in the scripture. Your faith is going to suffer a shipwreck. Now, what causes you to get into a shipwreck concerning your faith? When you begin to reject what God has said, your faith is on the way for shipwreck. Now, I find it very interesting that Paul would use this terminology. Out of all the terminology he could use to be able to make some type of similarity to what he was trying to convey to Timothy, what he said to him was shipwreck. And it's interesting that Paul said shipwreck because Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 and 25 that I've suffered shipwreck three times. So he knew about the devastation of a shipwreck. He knew how completely violent a shipwreck was. He knows how traumatic a shipwreck is. He knows that in the midst of a shipwreck, you might be saved, but you're going to lose everything else. Are you hearing? Are you here tonight? So he, what he was trying to tell Timothy is this. Don't you play around with your faith. And don't you play around with what God has promised. Because you don't want to find yourself shipwrecked. Meaning you made it, but you lost everything else. Are y'all here tonight? See, you, you can recover if you are saved from a shipwreck, but the ship you were always on can't be recovered. That ship is gone. It's sunk. It's over. How does that relate to this? There is a possibility that the promise that God gave you, that the prophetic that he spoke to you, if you play around with your faith concerning it, you will end up shipwrecking what God desired for you and he will take your ship to somebody else. Are you here today? I am a preacher, third generation, but I am maybe fourth, I don't know. But I'm as, as anointed as I am because my father shipwrecked his faith. And so God said, I can't let this anointing fail, so I'll give it to the next to see if the next will listen and hear and obey and run and fight for the prophetic. Are you here today? It is very important that you begin to realize that the things that God has spoken to you, they are not going to wait forever. I know that's hard to hear. Well, God, you promised me that you was going to do this. It's not going to wait forever. God spoke a promise to you while you were 15, and now you're 65. It's possible. It got shipwrecked. Y'all got quiet in here. Because God will not continue to wait for you 
to fight for the thing he promised for you. You got to fight for it. Are you here? You got to get to a place and say, if this bank says no, I don't care. Because God, you said yes. And I'm going to keep going until I find the one that will say yes. If this person who owned the building say no, I'm going to keep going until I find the one that owned the building to say yes. I'm not letting one no stop me. Because I'm willing, Brian, to fight for it. Are y'all still with me? Because you don't want your faith to be shipwrecked. I'm getting ready to come to a close. You have to get it in your mind that I don't want to shipwreck his word. I don't want to shipwreck my future. And I don't want to shipwreck the prophecy of the prophetic that's been spoken over my life. Instead of shipwrecking, I'm getting ready to fight. Is there anybody in here tonight that God has spoken a prophetic word to you, whether it be through a prophet, whether it be through your pastor, or whether it be from you reading the word of God? If that's you, just raise your hand. That's what I thought, because God is always speaking. But let me tell you something, and I'm getting ready to finish, and we'll see what God does next. Are y'all still here? Y'all got quiet on me. Can I drink some water? I'm not as young as I was six years ago the last time I was here. Lord, have mercy. Just play some nice, Antoine. Play some real nice real quick. Hurry up, play some. All right, we back. You've got to be willing to fight for your future. The process of obtaining some promises is easier than others. Some are simply received. Salvation is a promise from God. When you say, Lord, save me, you can simply receive it. Grace is a promise from God, and if you reach out to God for grace and for mercy, you'll just simply receive it because some of his promises are easier to receive than others. With my children, if they want to eat, that's easy to receive. You want a roof over your head, that promise is easy to receive. But you want a brand new BMW 328i, that's not as easy to receive. That's going to take a little bit more. Are, are y'all here? So some promises are easy. But then some promises, they take a little bit more. Like, you, it's a little bit more difficult if, if, if you're fighting for your healing. That, that's a little bit more difficult. Are y'all here tonight? If, 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 if you got a word about your family and got a word about your marriage, that's, that, that fight is a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if, if your mind is troubled, you got to fight for that word. It's a, it's a little bit more difficult. I remember in the year 2000 that my grandmother passed away in March of, two, of 2020, excuse me. And my grandmother was a beautiful person, and she left us, Pastor Pam, each of the grandchildren and children a little bit of money. And uh, when I found out she left us some money, I extended our stay. <laughs> Y'all got quiet on it. Because I had to make sure I got what grandmama wanted me to get. I got a phone call and they said, listen, what you have to do is to take your ID, go down to your grandmother's bank, show your ID, and sign some documents. That's exactly what I did. The bank opened at 10. I was there at 9.15. <laughs> the bank opened. I went inside with my ID out like this. And we went to the person's office. And they looked at my ID. They looked at my sister's ID. And they said, okay, we'll get the documents prepared. They got the documents prepared. We signed the documents. They said, hold on right here. We'll be right back with your check. Well, praise God. Take the time you need. And they came back with a check that was written to me. That promise 
was easy. It was, it was easy. Then a few weeks later, my mom passes away. And we find out that my mom has left us a little bit of inheritance as well. And so my sister and I, remembering the previous process in order to inherit the promise, figured it would be just as easy. We filled out the paperwork. We sent the paperwork in, and they sent us back paperwork and said, you have been denied. Now, hold up. Wait a minute. I got on the phone, called Pastor Emil, said, you got to be ready to fight. I said, well, what do I need to do? Told me what, what I needed to do. I called them back. And I said, what's the problem? They said, on your mother's paperwork, you're not listed as an heir. There's somebody else listed. I said, tell me who it is. They told me who it is. I said, I don't know who that is. And I'm telling you, that's not where my mom left the inheritance. She left it for me and my sister. They say, well, the claim on here is that they are the children of Levada. I said, it's a fraudulent claim. They don't have the right to the inheritance. Now, I could have sat back and just said, well, I'm going to let God work this thing out. And I'm just believing the prophetic and it's going to come to pass. And I would have been sitting there to this day. But I decided I had to fight. And I called them. I said, what do I need to do to prove to you that I am the heir of Levada? They said to us, you've got to get a birth certificate. The birth certificate will prove your birth and who your mother is. And then there's other documents that you got to fill out. So I got the documents, filled them out, went and got the birth certificate. I asked them, why was the birth certificate so profound? They said the birth certificate is the proof in writing that you are the blood DNA inheritance of this person. And that the promise, because of the blood that's in writing, belongs to you. So, 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 I, I got the birth certificate, sent the birth certificate in, did everything that needed to be done, uh, 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 made sure that everything was in order. I dotted every I, crossed every T, got on the phone, said, I ain't getting off until y'all get it. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying because I was willing to fight for what was mine. It was not about the amount. It was about the fact that it belonged to me. It was my inheritance from the promise of my mother. She said, I have stored this up for you. And I wasn't going to let anyone or anything take what my mama said was for me. And yet we walk around here And our Heavenly Father has spoke promise, has gave the prophetic, has spoken what he wants to accomplish in your life. And you go somewhere and sit down in an easy boy chair. I'm here tonight to wake you up. Get yourself up. You've got to participate in the process. Don't you understand that you are the rightful, I feel the Holy Ghost. Don't you understand that you are the rightful heir. You are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. You are covered in the blood of the Lamb. And the writing is proof that you belong, that you belong to God. So you got to get it made up in your mind that I'm ready to fight because I'm the rightful owner. God, if you said I can be healed, then I'm ready to fight. God, if you promise me that there's money in my future, then I'm ready to fight. God, if you promise me that my family's going to be whole again, then I'm ready to fight. God, if you promise me that my marriage can be restored, 
then I'm ready to fight. Do I have any fighters in the house tonight? I'm going to say this last thing and then I'm going to take my seat. What I love about this fight, what I love about this fight, Pastor Richard, what I love about this fight, Auntie Jan, is that this fight is fixed and it ain't fair. It's fixed and it ain't fair. All you got to do is get in it. Are y'all here tonight? Woo! I got to get ready to take my seat. But if God spoke a promise to you and you haven't seen it come to pass yet, stand on your feet. We're getting ready to fight. What you are surrounded by 
why are angels that are on guard to make sure that the things of God come to pass in your life. What you're surrounded by is his glory and his presence. I know you don't see it, but I'm telling you it's there. That is what is surrounding you, and that is how you fight your battles. Are you here? So don't stop fighting. Don't stop praying. I, I, I sense one more thing. Can I, can I have five more minutes? Three to five more minutes. If you need a push, I, I don't know what that means to you. If you need a push regarding your fight, get to this altar now. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I find my bed. This is how I find my battles. Come on, this is how I fight. This is how I 